Hello on Wednesday evening, which has turned out to be quite a sunny one, despite the freezing conditions of the day that's gone before. Um, I've got a cassock on, so it must be serious. And yes, I suppose this does flow out of my piece to camera on Monday night when I expressed my profound sorrow at circumstances in the United States of America and how it's overspilled here. Uh, yes, and I do feel continuing sorrow. Uh, and of course, it's now amplified by, in my view, the egregious use of a sacred text, the Holy Bible, our sacred text in a photo opportunity in front of, as it happens, a sister Episcopal church, uh, a photo op that was effected, made possible by the use of tear gas and batons on people lawfully and peacefully protesting, people who are clearly and literally uh, meta metaphorically and literally in the way of this photo op. Well, it reminded me of uh, the, a time uh, in the past when um, the author William Blake uh, was caused to write his little book called The Marriage of Heaven and Hell. It's a series of watercolours uh, with maxims and uh, his sort of quasi-revolutionary uh, ideological um, ideas uh, expressed. Uh, he was, as I'm sure you know, a painter, artist, sort of prophet. Uh, he made most of his money, I think, from making prints. He plays with these notions of heaven and hell. The background, revolutionary Europe. The book began about 1790, finished 1793. So the background, the revolution in France in 1789, that was really making the establishment in the United Kingdom very, very nervous indeed. Heaven is seen as a place of acquiescence and of peaceful complicity. Hell, by contrast, is seen as the more dynamic place of active resistance, being a nuisance, if you like. And Blake plays with those ideas, as you can imagine, uh, given his socio-political background. The book is tongue-in-cheek, but ever a true word spoken in jest. He could have asked, and in fact implies, is it really heaven or the bringing of heaven when we just sit by and acquiesce, afraid to upset the apple cart? Likewise, is it really hell or the bringing of hell when we resist the disagreeable? And uh, by resisting the disagreeable, um, we might, by implication, be um, saying something quite strong about it. Leave that to your imaginations. Well, in the course of my ministry, I've come to the view that the church generally, at least in its most organised and hierarchical forms, of which the Church of England is an expression, in my view, is not very good at expressing liturgically, and by that I mean in forms of public worship, the kind of bewilderment and sorrow and even anger we find as individuals and groups, large or small. Of course, we have various biblical texts, uh, Psalms of Lament, for example, of which Psalm 51, uh, more and on, uh, is an example. And we have the writings of people like Isaiah, Ezekiel, and especially Jeremiah and even John the Divine, writing after the destruction of the Temple in Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, it's often overlooked that in these days that the official, and I mean the official form of worship uh, within the Church of England, with no limit of time placed upon it, is not common worship, but is in fact the Book of Common Prayer. And I have a presentation version here. I think it was an ordination present. This is the official book still of the Church of England. And what do you know? It has a form of words in it that sort of fits the bill for these times. And it's called a combination. So lest we point the finger rather smugly across the pond, let's call to mind various shortcomings here in certainly our national life and political life. And this combination, as with other areas of the Book of Common Prayer, are 
awkward for many people to read and awkward partly because some of the doctrines contained within it which have not been revoked are very sort of fire and brimstone and remind us maybe of a more kind of Calvinistic uh, theology of, of, of punishment and eternal damnation and it's perhaps for some an uncomfortable reminder of our Protestant heritage as much as we like to float around in lacy cotters and all those sorts of things. Anyway, for our times, a wee cook's tour of a combination or denouncing of God's anger and judgment against sinners. And the byline is, with certain prayers to be used on the first day of Lent and at other times as the ordinary shall appoint. Well, I think maybe, hopefully, our bishops will direct us to a time of reflection and repentance and sorrow uh, after these days are past and for the intemperance, maybe, of some of the things that have been caused, have been done or said. Basically, what follows is a, a litany of the sins that have been traditionally sort of associated uh, with Christian living uh, very much along the lines of the Ten Commandments and I leave you in your own time to look through those and then surprise surprise it includes the text of the 51st Psalm have mercy upon me O God well if you want to uh, why not call up a version of Allegri's Miserere and read that in synopsis in translation with the with the version that you have in your prayer book or even in the Psalter and Coverdell's wonderful translation and after the recitation of Psalm 51, uh, things obtain a rather more temperate, conciliatory and forgiving tone. And I'm just going to read the words of the minister uh, as the day here draws to a close. O Lord, we beseech thee, mercifully hear our prayers and spare all those who confess their sins unto thee, that they whose consciences by sin are accused by thy merciful pardon, may be absolved through Christ our Lord. And then there's this wonderful prayer that is used elsewhere in a slightly adapted form as a, as a preface to a confession. O most mighty God and merciful Father, who has compassion upon all men, and hatest nothing that thou hast made, and wouldest not the death of a sinner but that he should rather turn from his sin and be saved. Mercifully forgive us our trespasses, receive and comfort us who are grieved and wearied with the burden of our sins. Thy property is always to have mercy. To thee only it appertaineth to forgive sins. Spare us therefore, good Lord, spare thy people whom thou hast redeemed. Enter not into judgment with thy servants, who are vile earth, miserable sinners, but so turn thine anger from us, who meekly acknowledge our vileness, and truly repent us of our faults, and so make haste to help us in this world, that we may ever live with thee in the world to come, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Some old-fashioned expressions there from a very different age and then there follows um, a corporate piece, a piece that the congregation gathered in church would say together. Turn us, turn thou us, O good Lord, and so shall we be turned. Be favourable, O Lord, be favourable to thy people, who turn to thee in weeping, fasting and praying. For thou art a merciful God, full of compassion, long-suffering and of great pity. Thou sparest when we deserve punishment, and in thy wrath thinkest upon mercy. Spare thy people, good Lord, spare them, and let not thine heritage be brought into confusion. Hear us, O Lord, for thy mercy is great, and after the multitude of thy mercies look upon us. Through the merits and mediation of thy blessed Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So in these topsy-turvy times, is it really heaven to acquiesce and just accept the wrong that we see? Is it hell 
to be actively engaged in uh, peaceful, lawful strategies that speak out against obvious injustice, environments and inequity. And thank you to William Blake for being so playful with those powerful concepts. And so to return with the final words of the otherwise severe combination. The rubric says, then the minister alone shall say, the Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace now and forevermore. Amen. And so say all of us. Amen. And I wish you a peaceful evening and a good night. God bless.